I have a question for you this morning. When you were growing up, do you recall any stress or hard times that happened? Am I on? That happened in your family as you, when you were a child. Maybe your parents were going through some hard times. There was some unhappiness. I, I think most of our families have some struggle at some point in, in our growing up years. If you spend 18 or more years at home, you probably witnessed something like that. And usually for the, us kids, it's pretty scary pretty stressful for us too because our about our own safety about our own security because our parents are our safety our security our world at that point and today we're talking about a father's strength it is father's day and we're going to be looking at the metaphysical principle of the divine masculine now if you were with us last month you might remember that we talked about for mother's day the divine feminine and how we all have both masculine and feminine principle within us because we are a unity right we are whole and perfect and complete in our manifestation of spirit so we have both of those principles within us you may have also heard phrasing in our communities mother father god have anybody heard that before? Mother, Father, God. And that is acknowledging the unity as God itself and not limiting the infinite to a gender assignment. And that's why sometimes you hear us in New Thought refer to the infinite power and presence of the universe to God as it because we're not limiting it to him or her. Okay? So as Diane shared with us this morning, our movie today at 1130 is The Pursuit of Happiness. And it does star Will Smith and his son. And it's based on a true story. It's based on a true story. A memoir was written by a gentleman named Chris Gardner. It's his story. And it's about his year of living homeless on the streets of San Francisco with his five-year-old son. A whole year of living homeless on the streets of San Francisco with a five-year-old. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Some of us can't imagine living with a five-year-old at all, right, Daniel? <laughs> I can hear you laughing back there. <laughs> so Chris is smart. He's a smart man, sort of like uh, Carter was last week in our bucket list movie. He was a smart man, but he was in a tough, tough situation. But he worked every day to create a better life for himself so that he could have a better life for his family as well. And through it all, he remained focused and believed that things would get better, that things would get better. He believed that he deserved happiness. He believed that he deserved happiness. His story demonstrates to us the importance of commitment to our dream to building strong relationships, to having faith, and to self-reliance. So we're going to look at those qualities of being today as it relates to our lives, our purpose, and our search for our own happiness. Our main character, of course, Chris, lived in financial stress all the time. The whole movie starts out about, I mean, actually the whole movie is pretty much about his financial stress and the burden in his life around that. He couldn't pay his bills, he couldn't pay his rent, and it was just always a struggle for him, his wife, and, and son. And the landlord stopped by one night, knocked on the door about dinner time, and he said, Chris, I can't carry you any longer. You haven't paid rent for several months now. You and your son have got to be out of here in the morning. You, you got to go. Chris was like, what? I can't be out in the morning. Imagine if you had to be out in the morning with all of your things and your five-year-old. And Chris was panicked. He said, I can't do that. So he negotiated with the landlord because the landlord said, you got to be out because I'm having the apartment painted. Chris said, look, give me a week. I'll paint it for free, but give me another week to work this out and figure out where I'm going to go. So the next scene we see Chris the next morning, angrily, you know, sort of painting the apartment. And when we paint with anger, we might get paint on us, right? So he had paint splatters all over him. And about that time, there's a knock on the door. And he goes down and he answers the door. And there's two police officers there. And they said, Chris Gardner? And he goes, yes. And he said, you're under arrest for unpaid parking tickets. So they take him down to the jail. 
And so you see him writing the check for all of his parking tickets. And the guy says, that's great, but, um, you know, we have to hold you overnight. We have to verify funds first. And that doesn't happen until 9.30 in the morning. So Chris made arrangements for his son, but he was panicked because he finally had an opportunity to interview for a great job, an internship with um, Dean Witter Reynolds at the time and to become a stockbroker. It was an internship for that, and that was at 10.15. And here he was in jail until at least 9.30 the next morning. Imagine his frustration. So the next scene that we see is Chris running from the jail down the street, trying to get to the building where the meeting is going to be held. And you see him go in the elevator and up in the elevator with all of the people in beautiful business suits and ties and shiny shoes. And here's Chris in his sneakers, his blue jeans, his uh, t his um, the undershirt that is a tank top style. Maybe you know that as a another name. Yeah, muscle shirt. There you go. That's a, that's a nicer name. And, and his members only jacket. Remember those? And remember, he's still got paint on him. And he's going for his shot at this internship. And he's in the waiting room and he's wondering, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he's sitting with all the boys in the shiny shoes. Can you imagine how he felt? So they call him in for the interview, and he decides to just be honest with them and tell them what happened. And he did. And they gave him a shot. They gave him the internship, one of 20 positions. It, he did not let his appearance stop him. He was committed to getting this internship. This was his shot. This was his opportunity to do more for himself and for his family to finally be happy. So he was not going to miss this. And he stayed committed to it. But then he finds out it's unpaid. It's an unpaid internship for six months. Can you imagine his disappointment, his frustration, maybe even anger in that moment of working so hard to get that opportunity and then being told, oh, yeah, you're going to work for us for free for six months. Okay, good deal, yeah? We're going to train you. We're going to train you. So he, you can almost hear the screeching or the brakes in his head going, ah, how can I make this work with my son? And working there during the day with no income, feeding my, ch my child and rent, and oh my gosh. Yet this is a great example of faith and trust in something greater than ourselves because our yes... Our yes to the universe lines up the universe to bring us what we need in the way of support to achieve that which we've said yes to. So Chris said yes. He committed to six months of unpaid work for the opportunity to maybe get a job as a stockbroker, to learn how to be a stockbroker. And he had absolutely no idea how he was going to make that work. No idea whatsoever, but he knew he had to say yes. But we see that Chris is resourceful, and we know that spirit provides. We know that's how the law works in our lives. And throughout the movie, we see Chris relating to people. It was very impressive how whenever he met anybody, even if it was a landlord giving him grief, right, asking for money, he shook their hands, he called them by name, he had relationships with people. While he was an intern at Dean Witter, we saw him building uh, relationships. During the training portion of it, the trainer kept saying to Chris, you know, asking for favors, hey, Chris, would you get me coffee? Hey, Chris, would you go move my car? Hey, Chris, would you get me some more coffee? Hey, Chris, how about lunch today? Now, did Chris resist him and say, who do you think I am? Am I your waiter? I mean, what? what, what do you, what's going on here? No. He went with the flow. He did it. He built a relationship. And uh, the real Chris Gardner, I saw an interview with him, and he explained that those events actually took place and that the trainer was still a very close friend of his even today. 
30 years later, whatever it is. He said, what he taught me was the importance of having a sphere of influence. Nobody cares what you or what your business has to offer because everybody is good. And even if there's a price difference between you and some other guy, the person with the best relationship is going to get the business every single time. Now, most of us know this as good business sense, don't we? Most of us know this as good business sense. When I started in real estate back in 1989, I was a wee child. And um, it was made very clear to me by my trainers that the most important part of my business was my reputation my contacts, my connections. It wasn't how much I knew about construction. It wasn't how much I knew about selling or writing a contract. Those things are important to that business, but the most important thing is your rep reputation, your contacts and your connections. And I have practiced that for the last 30 years. And the science of mind reminds us of the importance of getting along. If you read the text, you're familiar with that. Resistance to others obstructs hinders and thwarts, earnest word, thwarts the creative process. It goes on to say resistance is the act of striving against, pushing against our good, saying no to our good is when we are in resistance. So if Chris had been resistant to that trainer and, and getting him the coffee and doing the things that he asked for, his life may not have turned out as well. We don't know. We think of it like swimming upstream. If you've ever, if you're a swimmer, you've ever swum against a current in a river or, or a creek or something like that. It's like swimming upstream. And Abraham gives a great example of this in teaching the law of attraction. She says, "Stay." She says, "Put your canoe in the stream of life and go with the flow." Put your canoe in the stream of life and go with the flow. Don't turn it the other way and paddle upstream and make it more difficult than it needs to be. Chris went with the flow and he built contacts and relationships that helped him to achieve his dream. But many times we forget. We forget and we say no through our ego. We say, no, I'm not going to get your coffee. Go get your own doggone coffee. No, I'm not going to move your car. I'm too busy. Go do it yourself. Rather than simply saying, yes, I'm going to be of service today. Someone asked me to help and I'm going to help. I'm going to say yes. And we see that Chris had great faith. He had great faith in himself. He had faith in his dream. He wanted to be happy. He had a goal. He wanted, do you want to be happy that badly? to stay committed to your own happiness. Chris did, we see it in the movie. He wanted to be happy and he remained faithful to his dream and he continually expanded himself, recognizing that the place where he was was not gonna get him to where he wanted to be. He had to expand, like we talk about expanding our consciousness to receive more, he knew he had to do that. So he was willing to take that unpaid internship to expand his his vessel of receptivity for more. He was willing to do that. No matter what life threw at him, he continued to push on to paddle in the direction of his dream, happiness. And he believed that this would make him happy. There is a surprising scene in the movie, though, because you see Chris moving along with all of his positive um, words and everything. And there's one scene where he's playing basketball with his son. His son loved to play basketball, wanted a basketball for his birthday, and they gave it to him. And so he's shooting hoops with him one day, and the child is making baskets. He's five years old, and he's making baskets. I was, I was impressed. And uh, the kid says, Dad, I want to be a famous basketball player when I grow up. And dad says, now, son, don't get your hopes up. I wasn't very good as a basketball player. So odds are you're not going to be very good either. It kind of happens that way. So I wouldn't get my hopes up very much. And that was really surprising coming from him. And then we see little Chris. He's just dejected. He drops the basketball. He hangs his head. You can see his whole body language. He's just crushed. He takes his basketball and he's putting it away. And about this time, dad realizes what he did. He's like, uh-oh. 
So he corrects it. He corrects it in the moment right there. He says, hey, don't ever let somebody tell you, you can't do something. Not even me. You've got a dream. You have to protect it. When people can't do something themselves, they want to tell you that you can't do it either. If you want something, go get it. Period. Chris demonstrated his faith by holding fast to his dream and doing what he had to do to accomplish it, setting a very bold example for his son about the importance of believing in ourselves. It's a wonderful scene. It's a wonderful scene. Now, it was Emerson who, in his essay called Self-Reliance, anybody ever read that, Self-Reliance? Yeah. He said, to believe your own thought, that is genius. Rather than discounting our divine ideas, our thoughts, but to believe them, he says, that is genius. And Chris demonstrated this by his belief in himself to better his situation. He didn't doubt that he was capable of being happy, of bettering his situation, of getting out of the financial struggles that he was having. He did not doubt that. He believed in himself. Demonstrates his commitment to his family and how important it was to him that his family trust him to do the right thing. He says that several times in the movie. Trust me and we'll get through this. Trust me. I'll work this out. Trust me. I'm going to make this happen. He had learned to trust himself and to invest in himself, right? He invested in himself to improve and better and expand himself. Now, unfortunately, his wife couldn't quite get there, and she moved to New York to try and get a better job uh, with her sister uh, in New York. But his son absolutely, absolutely believed and trusted his dad at one point in the show. They're in a homeless shelter, and the little boy looks up, and he says, you're a good papa. Aww. Yeah, you're a good papa. That's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear and a good Father's Day message for us. So the character of Chris, we see the divine masculine. We see the divine masculine. And Ernest Holmes, who's the author of The Science of Mind that we teach from and the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living, he defines the masculine pr principle as the assertive principle of being, the self-conscious, self-propelling power of spirit, the projective principle of life, impregnating the universal soul with its ideas and concepts, the self-assertive spirit in either God or mankind. This is the beginning of the creative process that we teach. If you remember the teaching symbol, the top part is God, spirit, idea, seed, and the ideas, the concepts, those are the seeds. That is the divine masculine principle, your ideas that come forward. We then place those into the creative soil, the womb of creation, the receptive feminine soil for the manifestation then of the plant or form. So that's what this, uh, the divine masculine is. Chris demonstrates the self-assertive spirit by investing his life savings in that crazy, in that bone density, <laughs> in that bone density scanner that he sold door to door to hospitals and doctors. Can you imagine? Hi, we've got a brand new piece of technology. You have to invest in 25 units and then you get to inventory those and then you get to go sell those and whatever you sell them for is yours because you've already paid us all the money. Good luck. Turns out the unit was a little better than an x-ray, but about twice the cost. So it was a hard sell. It was a hard sell, further complicating his life. But he went for it. He tried it, right? He did something. He was proactive. And then he demonstrated it by demanding that his son stay with him in San Francisco and not go to New York with his mother. He de demonstrated that principle, and he also demonstrated it by act actively going after that internship position and getting it, and getting it. He was assertive in his, his actions. 
again, we all possess this divine masculine, right? We all possess it because we are a unity. And I bet if you think about your life, you can remember when you planted some seeds, some creative ideas into the universal law and active creation. We have a box full of those here from January when we sat our intentions for 2021. Those were your seeds, your creative ideas and concepts that came to you that were your heart's desire. So you've planted that. You've all had the experience of the divine masculine in that Everyone creates in this manner, but the question always is, are we doing it consciously or subconsciously? And we know that most of our life, 95% of it is subconscious, right? And our work is to reduce that 90, 85, 80, 75, 50% unconscious so that we can be conscious creators in our lives to bring forward the dreams and desires that we we have and want to experience. So this story demonstrates the spiritual, the emotional, mental, and physical strength of the father that was with a purpose to create a better life for himself and his family. We, we feel his purpose, and that's what we're talking about this month, is living on purpose. And he, ha he demonstrates purpose throughout the whole movie, and he stays focused on it. He demonstrated the divine masculine and the assertive spirit that lives, moves, and has its being within us. We all have that capability to become very focused on a dream, very focused on an intention, and to stay with it, and to have that assertive nature within us to make it happen. And there's a sacred balance. There's a sacred balance between that divine masculine assertiveness and the divine feminine receptiveness. And that is the wholeness in which we live, the unity in which we live. And Chris shows us this in his going for his dream and caring for his son. He blends that balance and that harmony of the, the both uh, qualities of the divine. So divine harmony in life is in tune with infinite order. We're in tune with infinite order and recognition of that father power within us. Ernest Holmes says that this harmony adjusts our affairs and enriches our lives. So when we can find that harmony, it's like, you know, when the orchestra begins and it's notes everywhere and it sounds chaotic and then all of a sudden they all come to that one beautiful note. You can almost get chills just thinking about that note because it's such a harmony that we recognize. It's just in alignment. And that's what happens when we say our yes to our dream. It all <laughs> begins to come in line for us. So let's take a look at our practicing the principles this week and see how we might find more harmony and happiness in our lives this week. And just a reminder, um, Mindful Monday, that's the newsletter that I send out every Monday morning. We've got about 45 people on it, so we're achieving our mission of getting our message out in the world. It's uh, open to anyone that'd like to sign up. If you haven't, you can do so in the lobby. If you're online, just send me an email and I'll make sure you get on the list for tomorrow. And number one, uh, make a connection. Make a connection. We are interdependent beings, yes? yes? Interdependent upon each other. Connected in the unity and the wholeness of life. And our relationships to each other are vital to our happiness and to our successful living. It is that yin and yang, isn't it? That it's, it's, cr it's critical. It's why we come to community is because we have this interdependency upon each other and we're just better in community. Would you agree? Would you agree? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, we're better. So this week I'm inviting you to reach out and connect with someone. Maybe it's a stranger that you've just met that you turn into a friend. Maybe it's a friend you haven't connected with for a while. Reach out and connect with someone. Connect and be present in the unity that you share and recognize that unity. Number two is strengthen your faith. Again, recall your intentions from 2021. Do you remember what your intention was in January? Recall that intention. How strong is your faith in that dream? 
Is it strong enough to take a six-month unpaid internship? Yes. <sighs> Big question. Big question. This week, take your intention into your meditation and deepen your faith into its potentiality in your life. We're about mid-year. It's a good time to do that. Number three is put on your big boy or big girl britches. I think most of that whole group of sayings came out of Texas, but when I think of Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, that's what I think of. And it's a wonderful resource, it was a wonderful resource to Ernest Holmes in his creating the science of mind and to understanding the, the metaphysical, so to speak. And we hear the theme woven throughout the science of mind, throughout the text, and ideas like teaching us how to think rather than what to think. Ideas that are about our unique wholeness and the laws of creation and how we can use those in our life. So this week, I invite you to journal about the idea of your own self-reliance. You can read Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, online if you would like. Portion or all of it, it's, it's very good. Um, and then discover what self-reliance means to you. What does self-reliance mean to you? And then where are you living it? And maybe where it might need a little work. What areas of life might your self-reliance need a little work, a little attention? And number four, again, we're approaching mid-year and just checking in. Where are you with your intentions that we set in January? We made commitments, set our intentions. What is your level of commitment to that dream today? Still good? Need a new one? Achieved that one already? Moved on through another one? Whatever it might be. If you want to set a new one, just deposit it in the box. Those get constant prayer and support, so just put another one in there. And keep track of your, of your dream. So relationships, faith, self-reliance, and commitment. These are all qualities of being that demonstrate the divine masculine principle of spirit that is within us all. So how are you, de how are you demonstrating these qualities in your life to live your purpose? How are you demonstrating those? I want to close this morning with a quote from George Washington Burnap. He was a, a reverend, and he said, The grand essentials to happiness in this life are something to do, something to love, and something to hope for. So this week, I hope that we each can experience these essentials in our lives each and every day. So it is. Would you join me for a prayer as we anchor this this morning in affirmative prayer? How good it is that we come together in community this morning as we connect in the one as the one, recognizing that there is only that infinite power and presence that we know is God, the infinite source and substance of all that is, the creator, the creation, and the created. It is infinite love. It is harmony, balance, prosperity, joy, wisdom, intelligence. It is that divine order that surrounds all of life always. And we know that all of that power, that presence, that life that is God, all of that love is right here, present in this moment. And I know that it is in through and as me as an expression of it, unique, whole, perfect, and complete. And as I know that of myself, I know that for each one of us gathered here today in the room, online, and joining us later, knowing that we are all in this unity and wholeness of the divine, that we are all expressions of God itself, that we are whole, whole in the divine masculine, whole in the divine feminine, whole in the unity of that expression of the divine. And so knowing this, I speak my word for and about each of us, knowing that as we move into these principles this week of commitment, self-reliance, faith, that we anchor in those truths, 
recognizing that we are sourced of the divine and all that we need. We are guided and guarded in each and every moment for whatever the creative expression of our life, the urge that we're feeling to express, to create, that is moving through us is spirit in action. And knowing that our sacred yes, that our commitment of the heart aligns the universe in our corner to support us for all that we need for the accomplishment of that yes. And I know for anyone that has anything on their heart today that they seek prayer around, that as they lift that into the consciousness of this prayer, that we surround that with our love and our joy and our support, knowing that whatever needs to be revealed is revealed with clarity and that whatever needs to be healed is healed, that the universal healing within is revealed and that prosperity flows and needs are met and that relationships and connections occur recognizing the joy and happiness in that interdependency of relationship and that creative expression, that we are sourced of divine ideas for the best creative expression in our life right here and now. How grateful I am for this, for I know this is how the law works. I'm grateful for the manifestation of the prayer. I'm grateful for all of the good that has been experienced in this center today and, and always. I'm grateful for all who are here and participating in it. As I release this prayer into the action of law, I know that the word spoken is the word made manifest. And so I joyfully release it into the law, knowing that my work is done and that I just let it be and let the law work. And we affirm this truth together by saying, and so it is.